I just invite the facilitators just to give us maybe one or two minutes of their reflections of the breakout groups. Um, and uh, shall I start with Kieran? Let's put him on the spot. Kieran, would you like to just um, give some feedback about your group? Indeed. Thank you very much, Chris and everyone. So um, we had some really uh, broad and deep discussion. Um, in this first session, we talked about the contrast between explicitly inclusive spaces and non-inclusive spaces, but quite importantly, how it's not a one-time thing to create a safe space. Like coming out, you know, we don't come out once and then we're done. It's an ongoing process. And similarly, it's an ongoing commitment to creating safe, safer spaces. Um, one, of, one of the group compared the experience to coming home and being at home contrasting with the experience of being homeless and feeling like one doesn't have a spiritual home or a place to belong um, and how the, these safer spaces are precious because they're few and far between um, and, and reflecting on how churches can communicate that commitment to inclusion to be visible about where they stand and why so that people know that it's a safe place for people to come. And in the second group, we talked about the importance of hearing lived experience and how one can choose to be fearful of or open to difference and how sometimes churches tend to be more fearful than open. Um, in terms of the specific needs of the trans and LGB communities, we talked about the, that because of the prejudice that we experience, then there is a greater risk of mental distress and even um, risk of suicide, which is... Uh, greater for trans people than it is for lesbian, gay and bi people at this point. Um, so we also talked about um, how we need to be safe enough to take risks. So being a safe space can give us the confidence to feel empowered to take the risks to, to, to step out and grow. Um, and we had some really deep sharing around how people might experience trauma in church how it's really important to be able to acknowledge trauma without the victim being blamed. So for the church leader who hears somebody's trauma to try and avoid going into defensiveness and, and blaming or shaming the victim who discloses. So it's really important that we have compassionate li listening to acknowledge that churches cannot, are not always healing spaces and also to signpost to other organisations to not feel like we have to have all the answers. Thank you. No, thank you, Kieran. Yeah, some really good points actually being raised. So can I move next to Andrea? Would that be all right, Andrea? Chris, thank you. And um, a, a lot of synergy, Kieran, with what you've just described um, in our group, which had a really kind of rich and full conversation. We talk quite a lot about knowing the limits and boundaries that we have in church and, uh, and mirrored your point about external referral, particularly for additional support where trauma and harm has been uh, uh, very much part of somebody's experience. Um, we talked also a lot about sharing power and how things can often go wrong in environments and particularly church environments where you've got individuals who are trying to hold a grip on what the church community needs to look like and how it will function and therefore the limits within it. And the real power of, of being able to see individuals from our LGBTQIA plus community in positions of church leadership, whatever that might look like. And we had some conversations around some of the limitations about that. We also had a really helpful input around um, understanding that what makes one person feel safe may not make another person feel safe. And the importance of these conversations, starting with what is it that you might need, what would help. Uh, and particularly where there's been previous experience of trauma, what might help you to feel safe in this place? What can we do together? Uh, uh, there was also a real tension uh, at some experience of churches having moved to becoming very inclusive or uh, overtly affirming environments, uh, that the uh, fear uh, from the wider community who've had poor experiences of church in the past. The mistrust of that is also a, a, a very real challenge in this conversation and the kind of slow building of relationship and trust was shared by a number in the group. Lastly, I suppose a key point was around the autonomy and the importance of taking on the capacity to learn for yourself, us all taking on the capacity to learn. Very much responding to um, Alex's uh, 
excellent representation of all of the resource, all of the work around trans and non-binary safeguarding, but the sense of actually there is a shared responsibility here to learn and to uh, grow and improve in our use of language and how we relate to each other without adding yet another burden uh, or yet another point of exhaustion uh, to those who are leading us so well, including uh, Alex and others. Um, so I hope there was so much we uh, uh, said, Chris, but I hope that's a, a, a helpful sum yeah. up of some of the key points. No, no. I, I'm impressed that you managed to sh shrink it down to that small amount because there was so much in the conversations that it's difficult really to choose the bits that you want to share. But thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, can I go to Bingo next, please? Hi, Bingo. Hi. Um, <clears throat> yeah, my, my group, we talked a lot about um, if we're going to have sanctuary that we that we need to that LGBT people need to feel unremarkable in <laughs> in uh, in the spaces that they are that we're not uh, you know uh, we're not the cause for it, it less of, less about kind of you know uh, specific abuse and more about just being treated as the odd one out and being being uh, exceptional rather than it just being part of the part of the normal uh, variety and richness of, of life um, and being treated as individuals rather than as as some uh, interesting uh, separate group of people. Um, we also uh, talked a, a lot about how um, alongside treating LGBT plus people as unremarkable, that we needed to be blunt and open about uh, our sanctuary and our safeguarding uh, of them. That if we're, if we're kind of noisy enough about the safety of those people in our spaces, then the, we can be a lot quieter about the individuals themselves. Um, <laughs> And uh, so, yeah, and um, uh, moving on, talking about uh, safeguarding, um, we talked about kind of um, sort of the lack of safety that a lot of LGBT people are already bringing with them when they come to our churches, that it's not, you know, there, there's a greater sensitivity to microaggressions and to... Uh, trigger points because of the experience that people have outside of church and outside of of the um, and so are more likely to be affected by uh, what happens in church um, that we needed to treat um, LGBT specific abuse like we do other kinds of abuse that actually it needs it shouldn't be a a kind of um, a lesser thing. Um, a lot of a lot of people kind of uh, people in our group kind of felt that it was sort of an add-on rather than a a general part of of how we understood spiritual abuse and how we understood uh, financial abuse and various other things. Um, <clears throat> also talking about um, triggers and how actually for many people walking through the door of a church is an enormous trigger you know people who have been traumatized by the church um there are whole trappings of church life that are just triggering and re-traumatizing for them um and that maybe we need to find a way of building church spaces with as little church to them as possible um so that people who have been have experienced trauma are not re-traumatized by having to enter these church spaces to experience spiritual life. Mm. Mm. Oh, that's quite some thoughts, actually. That's, that's kind of challenged me, that uh, the thought about making the church less churchy to help people get across the threshold. Mm. I think that's a really good point, actually. Thank you, Bingo. Jade, could you give some feedback about your breakout group? Yes, certainly. So in our first chat uh, we thought about how true sanctuary leads us to feel seen heard and valued uh, a space where we can use our whole selves and use our gifts and skills freely 
And we were really struck by Jared's image around the, the four-year-old self and the four-year-old experience that was shared. So we had to think together about what we need to be and do and say for children, especially in church environments, and for the vulnerability that we experience as LGBTQIA plus adults as well. And we finished that first round with a question of what we might say to our younger selves and some lovely thoughts around that were, uh, it is going to be okay. It is going to be okay. You won't always have to fight and there will be times when you can breathe easier than you can now. Mm -hmm. And then when we moved into thinking about safeguarding, um, we thought about the role of power, which has already been mentioned um, in that, and about the, the planting, growing and remaking of a culture um, and how so often the exclusionary approach to safeguarding is a culture that has been bred that needs to be diminished and regrown into a, a different, inclusive, safe culture. We thought as well about how we can't name a space, a safe space, but actually the person that is experiencing the, the space gets to define whether or not it's safe for them. So what we thought about were including components of safety so that a space may feel safer over time. Uh, we thought about in terms of the church being a space for risk taking, we thought that Jesus was countercultural, so churches need to be countercultural. And I'm afraid to say we have a, lot, a series of questions rather than a series of answers. What kind of risk? Who is taking the risk? What is the church risking? What is the individual risking? What is the couple or the family risking? In terms of the church supporting people who have experienced trauma, uh, we thought, ask us what we need. Nothing about us without us is a mantra that, that lots of groups are using now. And although the church shouldn't be a substitute for professional support, we thought about the importance of signposting, but not too quickly. So as people are not feeling like problems or experiencing rejection too early on, we thought about being a good friend, about uh, spaces where the church can apologize and acknowledge the damage that has been done and a really lovely point around non-defensive listening. <laughs> and we thought about bringing LGBTQIA plus inclusion and safeguarding to the table. So we'll finish with this. We talked a long time about the table. So here are our final questions. Where is the table? Do we even have one? Who owns the table? How many chairs are at the table and who is on them? Who wrote the invitations to come to the table? Who, what else is on the table? How has the table been prepared and how accessible is the table? So that's not to say we shouldn't be bringing things to the table, but the table needs to be ready. Thank you. I love that last point. Um, I, think, uh, I think we could have a discussion on that in itself because it's really, really, I love it. I love it. Yeah. Thank you. Some really excellent feedback from all the groups. And I appreciate all of that.